talk about really is regional economic activity here in the central United States. That's the overarching thing. But for that, in that context, think about regional economic activity, uh, what I want to do is I want to think about what I have to go through to develop a forecast for uh, Oklahoma and the city of Oklahoma City. So when I think about when the city of Oklahoma City, one of my primary clients, comes to me and says, well, help us know what's going to happen next year. What's our, what's our sales tax collections going to look like? Help us budget. Help us prepare for the year ahead. There's basically three issues that have to be resolved before you can start a formal forecasting process. So the first thing you have to resolve is what's going on nationally, right? What's, you know, the Oklahoma economy doesn't exist in a vacuum. It exists against all that's going on nationally. So you have to kind of put broadly, what are my expectations for national economic activity? And then I have to recognize that within Oklahoma, there's still a defining industry in the oil and gas industry. So I have to broadly try to figure out what do I think is going to happen in the oil and gas industry. And then lastly, as I think about what's going to happen in Oklahoma, I have to try to balance short-run and long-run forces. When you think about the sort of Newton's second law of your body motion, remaining in motion, the second law of outside forces, you think about the acceleration trajectory of an object being a function of the outside forces that are acting on it. If I think about the, the trajectory and acceleration within a regional economy, I have to try to balance these short-run forces, things like weakness in your sector, low oil prices, and get some long-run forces. And that's really where, where I want to spend the bulk of my time and maybe offer some perspective that may help you uh, not, uh, not just survive uh, this year, uh, but think about uh, what, your, what the prospects are for our area in the long run. So let me show you three quick, three quick slides uh, on national activity. So on national economic activity, you see the blue bars, those are estimates of U.S. real GDP growth. Kind of moving now to the next year, uh, next year and a half, two years, and about two and a half, just under two and a half percent. We, in the long run, the United States grows at an average of just under three percent per year. So at two and a half percent per year growth, essentially what we're projecting is U.S. economic activity that's almost average, almost back to the long run average. When you think about labor market conditions, you see in the blue bars our trajectory for the unemployment rate trending down towards its long run inflationary stable average of about four and a half percent. And in the orange bar, you see our estimate for job monthly job creation on the first Friday of every month. The Bureau of Labor Statistics reports how many new jobs were created last month. Our estimate is that number sort of averages about 175 to 185,000 jobs per month as we go through 2016. Sort of an average in the normal functioning U.S. economy, the U.S. economy generates about 225,000 new jobs a month. So this is again almost, but not quite, to a long-run average in a really robust uh, economic period. Right when, when the United States is growing at three and a half, four percent a year, and the economy is really humming, we'll create 350 to 400,000 new jobs every month. 225 is about what we need to absorb the workforce growth. 175, 185, sort of almost average. If you look at uh, this chart of our expectations of interest rates and inflation, uh, you can see in the blue bars there uh, the, the in measure inflation the Federal Reserve favors. And you can see our estimate that it's trending back towards about 2%, but trending back very slowly, partly because of the weakness across the commodity sector in terms of commodity prices, very little inflationary pressure, but we're trending back towards the Federal Reserve's 2% target and moving towards, slowly over time, towards a normalized 10-year yield uh, of, three, uh, of close to 4%. And so if you think about these three pictures, the, the phrase I kept using over and over and over describing the U.S. economy was almost average. So if you're reading uh, financial newspapers right now, you click on CNBC in the morning, the words that you're hearing describe the United States economy are things like the new mediocre, secular stagnation, almost average, right? These are the, these are the ways that we are, we're trying to find new ways to say the same thing which is that for many, many years, ever since we come out of the Great Recession, the United States economy has consistently grown at, at, at almost average, unremarkable levels. Right? Now, it's been consistent for many years, which is a good sign, but we haven't seen yet anything that comes close to what we've experienced in the past in terms of robust economic activity. We're moving along almost average. The baseline expectation uh, is that almost average will continue in 2016. All right, so let's think about, uh, as I think about a forecast, I always think about the baseline expectation being the expectation that has the highest probability. And there's some probability out in the tails of the distribution that could be much, much worse or much, much better. The baseline expectation this year is for almost average to continue through 2016, but there's a lot of negative probability maps right now. Right, so if you're, if you're following the news, there's a lot of chatter building about the potential for, 
for recessions. We're working on a program right now in our research center uh, that goes out and trolls text mines, websites, blog posts, newspaper articles, uh, uh, you know, online comments, LinkedIn, uh, you know, blogs, blogs. It just gets all the information we can and essentially just calculates, adds up how many times are people using words like recession, right, or bear market, or correction. And so we're trying to go in and check, you know, is there a way to go in and use at some point when the sentiment raises to a standard doesn't actually become predictive? We're trying to gauge right now, does sentiment predict recessions? And we, I don't have an answer for that, but what I can say right now is that the sentiment is moving towards the negative side. There's a lot of chatter developing about the potential for a U.S. recession. This is potentially scary for Oklahoma, right? We, since, since the post-war era, we have never moved into a recession on the heels of cheap commodities. Recessions are predated by $130 oil, not by $30 oil, right? So normally in Oklahoma, when we move into a recession, the recession occurs on the heels of high commodity prices, which insulates Oklahoma a little bit, right? $130 oil, we move into a recession, the nation feels the impact right away, but Oklahoma, not so much. Remind yourself from the Great Recession, that started in December of 07. Really, we went through all of 2008. It didn't show up in Oklahoma in any meaningful way until 2009, and really the second half of 2009 at that. And so we had this really delayed entry into the recession experience. That would not be true right now. If the United States managed to move into recession, if the recession talk proves true, and we move into recession on the heels of $30 oil, and the simmering weakness that already exists in Oklahoma, Oklahoma would be hit immediately and mercilessly. Right? There would be no insulation, there would be no protection for the state of Oklahoma. And so we're watching this very, 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 very closely as we move through the first half of this year. I still think a recession is unlikely, but it's a possibility that we can't ignore right now as this, as this chatter develops. And again, as, as you guys are all too aware, the state right now is completely exposed to anything negative that happens. We have no protection for robust oil and gas activity happening uh, across the state. So let's turn a little bit and talk about, so if our expectation for the national side is almost average, what are our expectations on, on your side? Um, and here's, here's the top concert beginning to cure your hangover, right? There's no, there's no real good news on this side. It's really, really hard to articulate a bullish case uh, of significant price recovery for commodities in 2016. Um, and let's just look at a, a couple of pictures. We do in conjunction with the OIBA and OIPA and Bank s &B, this Oklahoma Energy Index, which tracks activity on a month-by-month -month basis in Oklahoma. It just collapses information like commodity prices, employment, stock prices, drilling activity, all into a single, uh, single <coughs> index. And the index is highly correlated with private employment. So the blue line here is, is your energy index, and the red line is statewide monthly private payrolls, private employment levels in the state. And you can see the tight correlation. The tight correlation seems to break down a little bit at the end of this data series, right? The, the energy index contracted sharply, but employment seemed to be moving laterally. If I take Oklahoma City's information out of the data series, the correlation picks up a little bit more steam. Now I see the two a little stronger correlation, still seems to be moving sideways, what we'll get here in a few months is we'll get revisions based on, based on a larger sample, a larger data series. We'll get revisions to these numbers, and we'll see that Oklahoma and Oklahoma City's, really Oklahoma's experience in 2015 was more negative uh, than the initial data reported. So I suspect if we came back and looked at this chart in a couple of months after they revised the data series, you'd see an even stronger correlation. But what I want to talk about a little bit after we talk about oil and gas prices is how is the state managing to move sideways in spite of the contraction? Right? Even though the energy index in the blue line has contracted sharply, how has the state managed to, to eke out some gains and move, and move laterally? So I gotta, one of the things I have to do is, unfortunately, it's a fool's errand, I hate to do it, is try to forecast oil prices. Right? Um, again, every year I do this, I think, why am I wasting my time? I mean, just put numbers in a hat, pick a number, and move on right? to, the next, to the next exercise. It's really there's a nice paper by an economist out of the uh, University of California, uh, Davis, I think, uh, Bruce Hamilton, that actually walks through uh, years and years and years of developing alternative ways to forecast oil prices and shows that how fatally flawed each of them are. It's a terrifically difficult data series to forecast. The EIA recently did this exercise and they said, well, you know, we often think about using past volatility to predict future prices, but in the case of oil, I actually have these futures contracts, so I have some estimate of futures prices. 
Maybe I could look at trading around these future contracts to back out the implied volatility and build some sort of a bandwidth around what are the, ex the, the prices that the market expects. And so sort of a, a reverse Black-Scholes process. This was in October. So the EIA went through this process, kind of a, a clever little process. They used futures contracts, this NYMEX futures contracts, blacked out, the, blacked out the implied volatility, which you see there in the dashed lines. Uh, and they concluded in October of last year uh, that market participants, based on their trading behavior, expected the price of the spot price of crude oil at the end of 2016 to be somewhere between $25 and $100. <laughs> so, so you can write that down if you'd like, so you can plan around that. I think at the end of 2016, somewhere between 25 and 100 is probably a reasonable. But the point is, there was so much volatility, nobody really knows what the price is going to be. Right? And this created a tremendous, this creates a tremendous difficulty in planning your drilling budgets, your personnel size, your operations for the year, as market participants have very wildly different expectations uh, of where prices are going to be. When we look at production in the United States, uh, what we found in 2015 uh, is that production was incredibly consistent. Uh, we did not get the sharp rollover that we expected from big budget cuts and lack of drilling activity. Efficiency gains uh, seem to allow producers to maintain production uh, out of existing well bores uh, longer and leave production higher. So we didn't get that rollover uh, in, in production uh, that was expected. Uh, when you look at the production numbers on a five-year basis, you see in the very top there in the, in the thicker line, 2015, November of 2015 finally begins to approach November of 2014, and finally on a year-over-year -year basis, we're just now beginning to see production in the U.S. Uh, begin to turn over just a little bit. But even if production in the U.S. begins to turn over just a little bit, we still have to deal with a, a, an incredibly high commercial stock. So these are commercial crude commercial stocks, and you can see from 11 to 14, kind of at the, the lower line. We typically move into the end of the year. We'll move into, to, generally we'll move into this time of year, uh, February, March, and early spring, with about 300 to maybe 350 million barrels of crude and commercial storage. We will move into this spring right now, we'll move into March 2016, with about 550 million barrels in commercial storage. Almost twice as much as we typically start with, as we typically need, as we move into the summer driving season. So we have a tremendous amount of storage that still, we still have to burn through. So not only do we have to get supply to turn over, then we've got to burn through some storage uh, in order to get some, uh, some recovery in, in prices. Cushing, of course, uh, is in the same situation here with uh, storage now at 65 million barrels uh, and talking in and reaching some sort of physical capacity, which all leads us to our price forecast. Our price forecast, which again, I recognize as a fool's there, and it's just a placeholder in my economic forecast, has prices tracing out this trajectory to about the low 40s by the end of this year. So our economic models are built around oil prices having a very modest recovery in 2016 to the upper 30, low $40 range by the end of this year. We do not foresee a terrific price recovery, and our, econo our economic models will fall apart as you get too far from this number. So if at the end of 2016, we're at 60 or $70, our economic models are going to fall apart. We're going to underpredict true economic activity. If we're at $25 at the end of this year, we're going to underpredict activity. So when you think about the economic forecast, it's sort of built around this idea of having some sort of modest uh, price recovery. I'll tell you on this front, we're really challenged now on both sides. We've had a supply pro uh, problem, supply discussion for a long time, but now we've augmented our supply concerns on the oil price side with demand concerns. So now we have factored into market prices until the last couple of days, in particular, concerns that China was in or an all-out financial crisis, right? Nobody really knows how fast is China growing. China's been buying a lot of crude oil up until the end of last year, but every indication is going into strategic petroleum reserves. We do not believe that they're buying oil to, 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 for the energy to, to drive economic activity. That's not consistent with any other Chinese data. Uh, everything appears that China is moving into a, a fairly serious correction of their own. And the debate now, is this a correction that China can, can, uh, can address with policy, or is this an all-out financial crisis uh, that will take multiple years and be contagious across regions of the world? Uh, I'm a little bit in the pessimistic camp. I think China's got some pretty serious issues 
they have to work through, but you have the Chinese concern, you have the possibility of US recession, so now you have this demand concern popping back up where the whole world is basically underperforming. We talked about the US economic continues being almost average. The US is the world's, is the only economy in the world that is even close to its long run average. And so we kind of talk about our experience as being kind of ho-hum, not great, almost average. Any other nation would take that. Any other nation would take almost average right now. And so we're really in this tug of war with the rest of the world. The rest of the world is in a very in an economic funk, an economic malaise. The United States is kind of chugging along at almost average. And we're in this tug of war with each other. And we started the same place a year ago. And we went through an entire year of 2015. And it's, it's a tie. <coughs> Nobody won. We didn't pull the rest of the world up into better economic activity. They didn't pull us into recession. We just sort of went through 2015 as a de facto tie, and we moved into 2016 with the same for tug of war building. And so when we look at oil prices, our basic take on oil prices is to get much of a movement off of a slow and steady recovery would take either a significant supply discussion coming up, right? So you need a, a significant supply discussion in the form of an OPEC cut. An OPEC freeze probably doesn't do it, but we've noticed in the last couple of days just the mention just the rumor that OPEC and non-OPEC producers might have a discussion about a potential freeze since prices 10 or 12 percent higher. Right? The market is really looking for any signal that there may be some supply activity that would drive prices higher or any demand activity. Right? So we move to the second half of 2016. If it looks like China is going to go back to 7, 8 percent growth, they're going to avoid a financial crisis. Their, their currency is stabilized. If the U.S. is growing at 2.5% per year, and it looks like we can ride off the prospect of a U.S. recession, if we get to June or July, we feel like the China and the U.S. problem are behind us, that will have some bump in prices. Because we'll put the demand concerns behind us, and we'll go back to a market that's just pricing the supply concern and not adding an additional discount for a demand concern. So right now you have, you, you just have both sides are telling a very negative story. It makes it very hard to, to, to posture yourself and put faith in a dramatic price recovery absent some supply uh, or demand disruption. So that's what we have. So two things that we've, we've got set aside now, right? Our, on our list of three things, the national economy almost average, oil and gas prices, modest recovery at best, right? So two for two, we're not, we're not doing very good. But here's the interesting discussion, particularly depending on, on where you're located at uh, here in the state. And that is one of the long run versus short run forces. <coughs> Geographers and economists uh, years ago uh, developed this idea of megalopolis regions. And a megalopolis is a subjectively defined geography where one city grows into another city, grows into another city, and pretty soon you have one distinct geography, right? Each of these cities growing into the other, they have their own unique economic and cultural identity, and we call these areas megalopolis. If you look at the list, there's generally 10 uh, readily accepted megalopolis regions by uh, alternative researchers. As your eyes go up and down this list, I'll tell you the last 25 years, three of these areas have grown in population much more rapidly than the rest. So if you look up on this list, I'll let you formulate your guess in your mind. Over the last 25 years, the area of the most robust population growth, number one on the list, uh, is the peninsula of Megalopolis in Florida, the Orlando, uh, Fort Lauderdale, Miami, uh, uh, Megalopolis regions. Uh, and I was telling audiences, I, I, this, this really surprised me, but uh, you know, when, when Hulu announced that they had the streaming rights to Seinfeld, do you guys remember this a couple months ago? And everybody said, well, who, like, who hasn't seen all the Seinfelds, right? I mean, they're on all the time anyway. I lost like six weeks of productivity <coughs> watching all the Seinfeld episodes. I don't know how I got, I got sucked into it. I had Seinfeld perpetually running on one screen. I just run episode after the other while I worked all day long. Uh, and I'm sure it, it, it sucked all the productivity out of me. But one of the things that stuck out to me as I was watching Seinfeld episodes was how many of these episodes in the early to mid-90s centered around the storyline of Jerry going down to visit his, his parents in Florida and how rapidly those communities were developing and the internal politics that resulted. Right? There's these storylines that were occurring in mid-90s television shows that were representing this large migration population movement to Florida. The second highest uh, population growth region in the Valley of the Sun, Phoenix, Flagstaff, Tempe, Arizona. The third fastest growing population region in the United States is the, uh, the I-35 border that runs from Texas right up to Oklahoma City. It's the third fastest growing population center in the last 25 years. If instead of looking at population, you looked at job growth, looked at employment growth up and down this, uh, this list, the I-35 corridor would move to the top of the list by a wide margin, right? If, one, if, this, if the second place megalopolis wouldn't even be close. 
So the last 25 years, this I-35 corridor has been the fastest growing employment center in the United States uh, by a wide, wide margin. Now, as you look at this, it may not surprise you to find that a lot of that's occurring a little south of us, right? Maybe a lot south of us now that we're in Tulsa, uh, and down the Texas region. So the Texas region has really sustained growth for a generation now. If you go back to 1991, we started our 25 year window. If you went back to 1991, you may be surprised to be reminded that Austin, Texas was a much, much smaller city than Oklahoma City was in 1991. Lower population, lower non-farm employment levels. It was a much smaller city than Oklahoma City was. And of course now it's just doubled. I mean, it's just ran right past Oklahoma City. When you look at Austin, Texas, these are some population growth rates. And if you just focus on the tallest bars there, it's Dallas, Houston, Austin, and San Antonio, these communities are all growing. They're sustaining population growth rates in excess of 2%. Now think about your finance, your, your financial rules of, of 72, right? Years to double. And you're talking about populations that are doubling every 35 years. Every generation are doubling in population. This is what happened in Austin. This is what's going on in these communities. They're just growing. They're sustaining two, two and a half, three percent population growth rates year after year after year after year. We look at Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City is sustaining a growth rate between one and a half and two percent year after year after year. Oklahoma City is really looks an awful lot like those taller bars in terms of sustaining uh, population growth rates year after year after year. You see Tulsa, who's not directly on the I-35 corridor, and they're further north. They don't enjoy the same population growth. Look at Kansas City. Kansas City's even a little slower growth than Tulsa. Kansas City doesn't enjoy it because they're further north up the corridor. The corridor is really located on this sort of the southern side. The, 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 the growth is located on the southern side of this corridor. My colleague, who, uh, whose field is urban economics, so he studies urban economic activity and how cities organize and develop, uh, he now refers publicly to Oklahoma City as the northernmost city in Texas. So that's, how he describes, that's how he describes Oklahoma City. And I always cringe a little bit. I always say, maybe we should say that in public. I don't know who we should say But when you look at Oklahoma City's economic reality, it begins to mimic and looks much more like the lowest tier of these top tier Texas cities than it does like Tulsa or Kansas City cities further up the corridor. If you zoom in a little bit, I'll show you a, a, a map of Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, and Colorado by county, and this just compares 2010 to 2014 population estimates. So just over the four year period, what was happening in these counties, we're getting more people or fewer people, and that, that whole sea of navy blue, everywhere you see navy blue, those counties are losing population. Fewer people there in 2014 than were there in 2010. So all the navy blue population losses, where you see the, the light green and the dark green, those counties are growing in population, but they're growing in population at sort of sustainable slow rates right less than a percent per year so the green counties those are counties that are growing but they're growing at sort of kind of slow normal typical rates where you see the tan and the brown counties those counties are growing over a four-year period at rates that exceed one and a half percent per year those are counties that are growing at transformative rates the types of rates of growth that bring people into your communities in mass and transform your community in just a generation or two with new population. And if you overlay the I-35 corridor, you can see Houston and San Antonio up to Austin, into the Dallas Metroplex, spilling north into Ardor, you see the Green counties have population growth uh, up and down the I-35 corridor. In the Oklahoma City Metroplex, you see the tan and brown counties. And then you see some pockets of growth around that, but you can really see, you can overlay the highway, the interstate, and you can see this I-35 corridor and the tremendous growth that's occurring there. Now what's interesting is in contrast to the I-35 corridor, you also see some growth up in, so you see the Brown County up uh, in northwestern Oklahoma, you see Woodward County up there, tremendous rates of growth, you see Midland Odessa up here in West Texas, you see some areas out there of tremendous population growth as well, but that population growth is not geography. Those are not long run factors, those are short, that's your industry. That's a short run factor, right? I was born in Midland, Texas. So maybe I'll take some liberty here. Uh, I'm sure many of you have been to Midland, Texas. People don't move there for the geography, right? That's not what drives you to Midland, Texas, right? It's giant economic opportunity, it's structural, it's the economy, but it's not a long run geography that, that makes this move. And if you think about this picture, I'll illustrate what the difference between having the long run forces and not having the long run forces by looking at sales tax collections. As you think about this map, let's just look at what were the city's sales tax checks this holiday season compared to last holiday season? 
So in the January sales tax checks, which is generally retail activity from mid-November to mid-December, so this picks up your, your Black Friday Thanksgiving shopping, this picks up your first couple of weeks of holiday shopping. If you look at the January sales tax numbers up and down this map, uh, in San Antonio, their 2015 January or 2016 January check was about 3% higher than their January 2015 check. So their sales tax, their holiday season up about 3%. Dallas and Austin, they were up about 7%, 65 to 7%, Dallas and Austin, respectively. Houston, their sales tax collections this January compared to last January, they were down about 2.8%. So they were down not quite 3%. Oklahoma City, we were down about 1.7%. Midland, Texas was down about 23%. Odessa was down 17%. Woodward, Oklahoma was down 28%. Right? So you think about the areas that have the, the areas that have some long run protection are surviving this weakness better than those that don't. Rural Oklahoma is completely exposed to the weakness from your industry. Tulsa fairly exposed because they're further up the corridor. They don't have the, the geography strength. Oklahoma City has had some protection. They've been able to push back just a little bit. If you look at just the first collection of bars, it's a lot of very busy graph here. But if you just look at changes in in, in employment. This just compares November of 2015 to November of 2014. So a little bit of lag in the day. The 20, November data is the last we had. If you look at the black bar compared November, this November to last November, you'd say, well, statewide, we're down about 1,300 jobs. Well, that's OK. Right? We're, okay. we're moving sideways, down 1,300 jobs. That's not bad. But if you look deeper, what you find is Oklahoma City is actually up about 10,700 jobs November over November. Tulsa is up about 600 jobs. November over last November. The rest of the state's down 12,600 jobs. So it's not that we're moving sideways in unison, right? Tulsa's kind of moving along sideways. Oklahoma City pushed back and will eke out some, some decent gains. Well, our non farm employment in, in Oklahoma City will grow by about 2% in 2015. We'll eke out some decent gains, but then the rest of the state is really bearing the brunt of this, right? It's out in the field where the brunt of this hit uh, is being impacted. If you're curious, since we're in Tulsa, you can see the manufacturing numbers. Look at the manufacturing numbers, down 7,900 jobs statewide. Oklahoma City's actually up 400 manufacturing jobs. Oklahoma City's here could have post one of its strongest years of manufacturing job gains in the last three or four, this in 2015. Oklahoma City's down 5,000, or Tulsa's down 5,000 manufacturing jobs. So Tulsa's really feeling the brunt of this experience indirectly through the manufacturing of all the support equipment, the pumps, the valves, the switches that go into the production and drilling process. It's really about how Tulsa has been uh, exposed. And again, they don't have that geography uh, to push back on. So think about what's happening in the state. You can think about it as having three different, three different versions of the story. The rest of the state, rural Oklahoma is just absolutely exposed to the weakness. They will continue to bear the brunt of it. Tulsa is far enough up this I-35 corridor and removed from the corridor itself that they have a little bit of protection, but not nearly as much protection as Oklahoma City has. Oklahoma City has a fair amount of protection that allows them to push back against weakness in your industry and maintain some semblance of economic activity. Right? It's going to be a challenge. Sales tax collections are being down. They're going to have to manage through it. But it will be manageable compared to what much of the rest of the state is facing. In Oklahoma City, a lot of those forces are yielding to short one weakness right, right now. So we saw at the end of last year, uh, new building permits kind of collapsed, uh, construction activity fell, uh, retail activity began to fall. So we really saw in the, in the very end of 2015, weakness move into Oklahoma City. Uh, and I'll tell you, as we move into 2016 now, we're in February of 2016, the worst of the economic headlines are still in front of us. All right, we're seeing some pretty bad economic headlines in our newspapers uh, just this week. We'll see the worst of those headlines over the next six to nine months at least. Right? So we haven't been through the worst of it yet. The worst of it's just in front of us. It's just now moving in. And as Oklahoma City gets hit harder, it's going to make that state data look all the more worse. Right? The state data appears to be going sideways only because Oklahoma City is holding a little bit, holding up a little bit. As that weakness moves into Oklahoma City, it's going to make what's happening in the state uh, all the more apparent. The worst of the headlines are, are still in front of us. So three pictures here and then a couple concluding comments. So basically, what do we see for the state? Best case scenario or baseline expectation is that the state basically has a lost year. No employment growth, a little bit of growth in Oklahoma City, offsetting job losses everywhere else. Basically, no income growth. Income growth basically zero to half a percent. No income growth through 2016. Uh, and another year of losing oil and gas jobs 
Um, we've been saying for some time now that, that as expectations firmed up, the prices could stay lower for longer and would be, would, would be unknown for even longer that producers would have to respond. Uh, we see another year of contraction uh, in the primary industry before having some recovery back in 2017. So the baseline expectations, we move towards 40, maybe mid $40 oil by the end of this year and get some strength back in, in 2017. But it's not, a, it's not a pretty picture. What is interesting is we talked to, we sample Oklahoma's around the state, and in the fall of this year, the last blue bar there, 42% of Oklahoma households in September of 2015 said, ask me again a year from now, and I'll tell you my life is better. It's kind of interesting that they felt okay that maybe we were gonna survive this downturn, right? That their, their outlook was still 12 months. Ask me again in September 2016, and I'll tell you my personal financial situation is better. They expect their financial situation to improve over the next 12 months, and we'll see if that comes true. That's, that's not consistent with the economic data. And so we're, we're sort of watching the data versus expectations to see you know, which, which gets proved wrong. Here are the conclusions we gave at a speech like this last year. I would have ended with a couple of, uh, a couple of conclusions. One was this middle bullet point, can we power the global economy or will we get pulled into the global malaise? And as I said, the answer here has been, we don't know, just a tie. It's a very bad year and we go into this, we have the exact same question now going into 2016, can we, can we come out of the malaise? Can rural opportunities absorb released oil and gas labor force? Right? Rural, or, you know, ag producers, food processors, uh, ag businesses up and down the board swore that they have been trying to hire people for years and as fast as you would let them go, right, as rigs came down and new rigs didn't go back up, as fast as you released labor force, they would absorb them and hire them. They swore they could absorb all this labor force and sometimes they just, they just couldn't, right? It just didn't happen. Rural Oklahoma is still being hit hard. All of the stories we had 12 months ago, 14 months ago, about don't worry about it, the oil and gas workers will find jobs somewhere else, has not proven true. And then the, really the question is, can uh, you know, the long-run forces offset short-run forces? The answer was kind of yes in 2015 in Oklahoma City, but much less likely to be so in 2016. We look and feel much more exposed to this weakness now going into 2016 than we did a year ago going into 2015. I think you'll see the headlines be much more negative over the next six to nine months than they've been over the last 12. I think that the worst uh, is, just, is still just ahead of us. So our discussion, our conclusion this year, shadow recession stability, again, I think it's unlikely, but don't discount it. I think you'll want to watch this very, very closely. And again, make sure you remember, if a recession develops in the United States, there will be no protection for Oklahoma. It will not be like previous recessionary experiences. We will feel it immediately and sharply. There will be no delayed entry into a U.S. recession because we're coming off of a year of low commodity prices. The recent decline in prices is really a demand issue. The supply issue is still there, but the most recent move is really a demand issue. Uh, we're going to need a disturbance to move us uh, to a different price path to go supply side or the demand side. Geography is important. Uh, and one thing I, I want to leave you with is some, some hope for the future is to think about the importance of geography and Oklahoma City's economic fate is almost certain, but not quite, right? I tell my Oklahoma City audiences, we really need, we need about one more generation, maybe two more generations of reliance on fossil fuels before somebody solves the energy problem, right? And that would probably do it to transform Oklahoma City's economy and seal its fate as a major diverse economy, as a major metropolitan area, right? We need one or two more generations. And the answer to the Oklahoma City question is really kind of going to come from this audience, right? The issue is that the oil and gas industry is now a technology industry. It is a technology-driven industry and will continue to be a technology-driven industry. We had an interesting speaker come down and speak at the Oklahoma City Chamber Outlook Forum this year. He was a technologist from Stanford in Silicon Valley. And he just kept saying, you know, this oil and gas industry is toast. It's just done, right? It can't survive. Technology is now running rampant through renewable energies and it's only a matter of time before renewable energies will surpass and master the economics that, that have made fossil fuels attractive. And he's not wrong. It's, I mean, we, we, know it's gonna, we know we're gonna transition away from oil long before we burn the last barrel of oil. It's, it's going to happen. We will solve the energy problem eventually. We will move away from fossil fuels long before we, we run out of fossil fuels, just as we moved away from coal long before we ran out of coal. The question is how much time do we have? I think one of the mistakes that he was making in his analysis is he was comparing the future trajectory of renewables given technology advancements 
against the current state of fossil fuels. And it wasn't factored in that fossil fuels are just as impacted by technological advances that will make them cleaner and more cost effective going forward, make these resource plays all the more cost effective uh, and, and cleaner as we go forward. Technology has a role to play there as well. I think he, I think he forgets that just a little bit. If you think about our graph, think about the long run trajectory for the mid-continent, I will tell you that Houston, Texas will surpass Chicago as the nation's third largest city in just a matter of years. It is inevitable. If we solve the energy crisis today in this room and we never again burned a drop of fossil fuels, Houston would still pass Chicago as the nation's third largest city. The people are already there, the birth rates are already there, the demographics there, the ages. It's a simple actuarial exercise. Houston will be, for my kids and my kids' kids, the three major cities in the United States will be New York, Los Angeles, and Houston. Chicago will drop down to that second tier with Philadelphia and some other major cities. It's already done. The East is in the dough. Houston's economic fate is sealed. This will be challenging. They will undoubtedly, this will stunt their growth, this will decelerate their growth, but you couldn't shake Houston from this path now if you wanted to. It's already done. Houston's gonna be our next generation, our kid generation and their kids. Houston's the third most important city in the United States. It's done. And what Oklahoma City needs, we're not as far developed as Houston, what we need is a generation or two to see what advances come out of your industry. What technology offices that have nothing to do with oil and gas, what applications that you're developing, working on right now, will lead to growth opportunities and industries that have nothing at all to do with oil and gas, but create spillover economic activity. The GE Research Laboratory going to Oklahoma City is an incredible uh, token of this transformation. What comes out of that laboratory will initially be designed towards oil and gas, but it will transform the Oklahoma City economy as we see applications of technology and industries that we right now cannot foresee. But the transition, the transformation is happening. And I think right now in Oklahoma, what we have to do is we have to start thinking differently about Oklahoma City, Tulsa, and the rest of the state. We need to think about them as three different cities. Oklahoma City is the northernmost city in Texas. Tulsa as your stereotypical Oklahoma City, and the rest of the state as the rural areas that are really going to struggle as people and activity continue to move towards urban areas. Thank you.